Wish TV presents Veterans Voices, honoring those who serve. Sponsored by Godby Home Furnishings and HVAF of Indiana. Hello everyone, I'm Phil Sanchez. Thank you for joining us on this very special anniversary, the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day. It would be the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month that the fighting would come to an end. Six months later, our troops would finally come home. November 11th would later go on to be known as Veterans Day. Indiana has been represented in every major U.S. war since the state was founded. We thought this would be the perfect place to start our tribute to the everyday citizens who step up and sacrifice and serve for our country. The Indiana War Memorial Plaza spans five city blocks and contains a museum, three parks and 25 acres of monuments, statues and fountains in the heart of downtown Indianapolis, making us second only to Washington, D.C. and acreage and the number of monuments dedicated to veterans. As impressive as the plaza is, how it all got started is an amazing story of its own. Brigadier General Stuart Goodwin, the executive director, gives us the history. World War I was 1914 to 1918, and the United States was involved in the last 19 months of the war. And about 135,000 Hoosiers served, and around 3,300 died. And so people started to talk about the fact that this might have been the last war we should ever have. This is the war to end all wars. We can't, we just can't solve our problems like this and affect this many people. I, they had a special session of the legislature. They actually called the, the Hoosier legislators back and said, we need to do something to honor these 135,000 who served and the 3,300 who died. And they decided to dedicate two city blocks, which turned into five city blocks. And the, the legislators actually allocated $2.2 million. Now this is 1920 and a gallon of milk costs a nickel. They spent every penny of the $2.2 million on this building. The War Memorials, none of this would have happened without World War I, which is why we're so closely tied to this. And so this building was actually started construction in 1926. In 1927, on the 4th of July, uh, General Blackjack Pershing, who was the commander of the American troops, uh, he came here and laid the cornerstone. And I gotta tell you, if there were time machines, that's one place I would go back. To, I think it would just be so amazing to have the American commander who basically won the war of the Great War, the last the war, we're never gonna have any more wars after this, to have him come to our town and lay the cornerstone, I get chills just thinking about it. Over a million people come through here each year. And every day, I still run into people and they say, I've lived here my whole life and I've never been in this building. Well, come on down. We want you to see this. It's free. We're open from Wednesday through Sunday, nine to five. And I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Traveling north from the War Memorial and across the Veterans Memorial Plaza, you'll find the American Legion Mall. Here are memorials dedicated to World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. It would be the Vietnam War that would carry one young Hoosier from a Sheridan farm across the world to a foreign beach. And it would be his military training that would bring him back to create a successful Indiana business. That was uh, my senior year in high school, playing basketball against Carmel. Nominated to the Indiana All-Star team in basketball back in my day. Two brothers, my sister, my mom and dad. Growing up in Sheridan, Indiana, northern part of Hamilton County was fantastic uh, life. Uh, on a farm, 
We milked cows, uh, had wonderful parents, and we learned to work uh, hard. I shared in high school, we all participated in every activity. And then I went to Purdue University. Being a farm boy, I thought that was the only uh, choice that I had to go to Purdue. But when I was there, uh, it was um, right after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. We were huddled around the TV every evening to see what was going to go on there. It looked, we were getting involved in Southeast Asia at the time and it looked like it was going to get more serious, so I decided at that time to stay in the ROTC program and it, you would become an officer uh, when you graduated out of Purdue University. It was a week after graduation and went straight into the Army a week after graduation to Fort Benning, Georgia. In, uh, I think it was April of 1965 that uh, they said that we were to uh, deport to uh, a foreign country. They did not tell us where, it was strictly secret. First time I ever flew on an airplane. And we flew then from uh, Fort Benning, Georgia to Oakland, California, where we boarded the ship to go overseas. We were on the ship for 21 days. And about a week before we landed, uh, they told us if it could be Vietnam. We were the first to land at Cameron Bay. Uh, it was a huge ship, 2,200 uh, soldiers on there. And we went over the side of the ship on ropes down in a landing craft. And we landed at Cameron Bay, not knowing how we were going to be greeted and so forth. Fortunately, there was nobody there. So that was a good thing. We had a tremendous job to do, there's no question. We were receiving troops every day to haul them to their base places. Uh, we were there to build an air base also. Um, about uh, 10 mile up the bay, we put in a huge air base. I remember the uh, Republic of Korea sending in troops, thousands of them, that we would haul then to their campsites. It was so, it was tough, a tough year because uh, I was so close to my parents and they didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. In that day, there was no computers, there was no phones, no cell phones. Uh, mail would take three to four weeks. At the time, I had a two-year-old son, Jeff, uh, that uh, I missed drastically. I really did, and uh, it, was, um, it was a tough year. I wanted to serve my country. I, I'm proud of the United States of America, and I think everybody that was in the Army was that same way. We would do whatever it took, whatever we were told to do at that time. It's the summer of 1966, I'd completed my active duty, and I wanted to live the American dream. Uh, I was born and raised on a farm, a wonderful family, high school, Purdue University. I served my country in the military. I worked five or six years in agribusiness, uh, which I grew up in. I studied at Purdue University. And then I decided to start my own furniture store. And to me, that is the American dream. I served my country, I served my family, and I started my own business. It's been very successful for 44 years. Um, and I also now have three wonderful children, their spouses, six grandchildren. I have lived the American dream, I really have. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. We're standing between the American Legion's National Headquarters to the east and the American Legion's Department of Indiana to the west. And behind me is the memorial of Corporal James B. Gresham from Evansville. He was the nation's first casualty of World War I. After World War I, our wars changed. We've seen how Jim Godby was able to return home from war and create the American dream. But for some, once they are out of the military, that American dream seems out of reach. 
Here are two examples of lives damaged and lives repaired thanks to the work of the HVAF, Hoosier Veterans Assistance Foundation, an Indiana organization that has been a lifeline for veterans for 25 years. We'll start back whenever you're ready. I think I was about 13 was when I went and to have my first beer. Little did I know at the time that it was going to turn, cause me to be a full-blown alcoholic. I went to the military and um, I signed up um, in uh, 1970, early 1975 on delayed entry. And then I went in in uh, June of uh, uh, 1975. I felt like it would, I would get some stability in my life. In the military, you could buy liquor at the age of 18. That was one of the biggest reasons. I think that's when I got up to half a gallon, half a gallon of whiskey a day. Now you got a harder piece about it. I joined the military actually when I was 17. Uh, I had turned 18 before I went in, but I had a son on the way, and so I was trying to figure out a way that uh, at the time that I could continue my education, uh, try to be a responsible father, take care of my responsibility. So I went into the Air Force because my thinking was at the time that it was the most technical of the, of the uh, four uh, branches of the service and what I wanted was uh, to get a background on electronics. Uh, well, I got out of the service, I went to ITT Tech and got my degree in electronic engineering. I was very successful in, in that I was motivated and uh, I enjoyed some success early on. Now, added with that, there was a sense of, uh, I say we go beyond pride, I say arrogance. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, you're in your 20s, you're young, everything's in front of you, the whole world is yours. Started hanging out, partying, drinking, using, and that's when I fell into dependency of uh, uh, cocaine addiction. And it's that vicious cycle. But all along, it wasn't just the drugs. And alcohol was my whole behavior was changing. So when things got bad at General Motors, I had some options. I said, Fred, if you keep on going the way you're going, you're going to die. If I had kept making that money, I wasn't going to stop getting high. I walked away from that job. To save my life. I was homeless for five years. I woke up one morning and I said, Fred, no, I said, Lord, I, I can't live like this no more. Once the drugs and alcohol was gone, I got to work on the individual. For the first time, uh, being a veteran, I went to the VA and they told me about an organization called HVAP that housed veterans while they was going through treatment. I have to remember that out of 10 people, maybe one will just get it at that particular time. And I looked at Fred, I said, well, Fred, you know, I didn't get it the first time or the second time. I said, matter of fact, I don't know what kind I was when I got it. Which moves thoughts from negative to positive. But the seeds planted, because that's how I got it. A seed was planted. So when, when I was ready to do what I needed to do, I remembered that. And we have planted so many seeds here at HVAP. So now I work as a social worker for HVAP. The same, the same organization that, that uh, helped me change my life. So, from that perspective, it's not just a job for me. I have a responsibility to help those who are coming around. It's simple, but it's not easy. h is a great program to be in because their goal it's not to let you go until you get permanently housed. I said, there's no program like that. Don't give up. Do not give up. If you know a veteran who needs assistance or would like to help, contact the HVAF of Indiana. We'll be right back.
We have traveled to the east bank of the Indiana Central Canal, home since 1995 for the USS Indianapolis Memorial, designed to recognize those who died on the last U.S. ship to sink in World War II. 1,200 sailors were on board. Only 317 survived. Earlier this year, the U.S. Navy and Lockheed Martin officially launched another city namesake. The new combat ship, Indianapolis, became the fourth ship in naval service named after our capital and built at the Midwest's only naval shipyard, which supports over 12,000 U.S. jobs. For many veterans, finding a job after they serve can no doubt be a problem, but there's one Fisher's nonprofit that's helping to teach veterans tech skills that are in high demand. We take a closer look at the Fisher's company that's serving those who served. Let's look in your values controller. Just off a visionary way in Fisher's, a vision is growing. We've made a concerted effort to reach out to veterans. I think we have a great opportunity to help those who are transitioning out of the military. He's Sean Gardner, the executive vice president of business development at the 1150 Academy. He's also a veteran. 23 years of service. The 1150 Academy is a school that teaches coding skills. The 12 week boot camp is designed for students who want a career in the technology field, although not solely for former military members. There are a lot of them here. The school is owned by a vet, employs vets, and teaches vets like David Witt. Here with coding, it's, it's like learning a new language. I mean, it's you start off from like not knowing anything and you just grow from there. David is an Indiana native who joined the military in 2001. He served in the Air Force for six years before moving back to the Hoosier State, got a degree in network security, but wanted something different and found 1150. He used his GI Bill to help pay for the program. So they paid for me uh, all the way through, and they give you a stipend as well. The GI Bill will give you, a, I believe it's Staff Sergeant pay. And there's a reason that veterans uh, are the right candidates to fill this tech uh, skills gap. One, they do come in with some life experience, some maturity, and the logic they need to be a successful coder. They come here with determination, the grit, and the uh, Termination for success. 1150 says their average starting salary for grads, $54,000 a year, with some grads earning as much as $70,000 a year to start. Gardner says companies are very open to hiring vets with a tech background. They know how to take orders, they know how to give orders, they know how to show up on time, and for the most part, they're drug free. So those are all great attributes that companies are looking for. People like David who is now helping to teach coding at 1150. It's a boot camp for, called boot camp for a reason. Um, it's 12 weeks, it's, it's demanding, but the reward is phenomenal. And when you finally do get the code to work, it is, I don't know, it, you get elated, you know, it's amazing. 1150 says they're always looking for students, especially veterans. For more information, you can visit their website. We'll be right back. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument was built in 1888. Monument Circle would become a gathering place for some of the city's most important events. When word reached Indiana in 1918 that the fighting had come to an end in World War I, people took to the streets around this very circle in celebration. It would take about six months for the Indiana troops to return home. Welcome Home Day was May 7th, 1919. The troops arrived by train and marched to Military Park where they were greeted by family and friends. For Indianapolis and the entire state, it was a celebration and a homecoming. We wanted to share that celebration with you from 100 years ago. And although the pictures are all in black and white, the faces of the veterans, their friends and family, and a grateful nation, surprisingly familiar. 
Thank you for sharing some time with us tonight. And remember to thank those who serve. Thank you.